Hi everyone, welcome to today's webinar, Bridging Gaps, Cultural Responsiveness in Delivering Education and Employment Outcomes for People with Disability from Cold Communities. This webinar is brought to you through a partnership between the National Disability Coordination Officer Program and Settlement Services International with support from the Australian Disability Clearinghouse on education and training. Before we begin, I would like to acknowledge Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people as the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia and recognise their continuing connection to land, waters and culture. I pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. I extend my respect to all Aboriginal people Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people here today. Today we are using Zoom for our webinar. Many thanks to ADSET for providing the Zoom platform and in particular to Jane Hawkswood for all of your assistance in setting up this webinar. If you experience any technical difficulties during today's webinar, please use the chat box or email Jane directly at admin at ad set.edu.au. You can use closed captions during the webinar. The webinar will also be Auslan interpreted. Welcome and thank you to our captioners, Paul and Sandy from Reporters Inc. and our Auslan interpreter, Kate Hinton. During this webinar, if you have questions for the presenters, please type them into the Q&A box. These will be collated by NDCO Alicia Ford and time permitting will be asked to the presenters at the end of the presentation. If you are unable to use the Q&A box in Zoom, please email your questions directly to Alicia at alicia.ford at sydney.edu.au. And without further ado, I'd now like to introduce you to our presenters, Karen Bevan, and Kylie Van Leeuwen from Settlement Services International. Over to you, Kylie and Karen, thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. It's wonderful to be here. Today, I'd like to acknowledge that I am on the land of the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation. I pay my respects to elders past, present and future and acknowledge Aboriginal colleagues, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander colleagues who may be part of the webinar. It's a delight for Settlement Services International to be sharing this um, opportunity to speak to you about the, the intersectionality of culture and disability. Settlement Services International, or SSI, is a community organisation and social business that supports newcomers and other Australians to achieve their full potential. We work with all people who have experienced vulnerability including refugees, people seeking asylum, and many culturally and linguistically diverse communities to build capacity, enable them to overcome inequality. On the slide in front of us, you can see that there are eight circles and they represent the people that we work with at Settlement Services International. We work with refugees, people seeking asylum, children and young people in foster care, young people, migrants, people seeking employment, people with a disability, and entrepreneurs. Formed in 2000, SSI, as we're known, is also the statewide umbrella organisation for 11 migrant resource centres and multicultural services across New South Wales. SSI draws on its expertise and experience to advocate for the people and communities it serves. Through the work we do, we empower people to change their lives, through our advocacy and representation, we seek to influence ideas and policy. SSI offers a number of government funded services along with other uh, self-funded initiatives that we, add, that we fund ourselves to add value to our contracted programs. We provide training to support service providers to work more effectively with people from culturally and linguistically diverse backgrounds and build their own diversity and inclusion within organisations through culturally responsive practice and building a diverse workforce. 
At the end of the um, webinar, I'll take you through a number of resources that SSI delivers that um, might be useful in terms of people's work in this area. As I go through the, the webinar, I will use the term SSI for Settlement Services International, and I will also use the term CALLED to, um, as an acronym for culturally and linguistically diverse, um, just so that um, you're aware if I, if I use that, that language. So SSI's vision, is to achieve, which appears on your screen, is to achieve a society that values the diversity of its people and actively provides support to ensure meaningful social and economic participation and to assist individuals and families to reach their potential. Our bilingual and, bi and culturally diverse workforce um, and 70% of our workforce are people who are from a cult identify as culturally and linguistically diverse. Um, our, so our workforce speaks over 90 different languages and it enables us uh, to overcome many cultural and language challenges that can inhibit access and successful service delivery. We highly value that bilingual bicultural expertise that is so embedded in our workforce. Our presentation objectives today are also presented on the screen. There are four boxes and I'll just read each of them before moving on to the next slide. So firstly, our first objective is to really examine intersectionality between culture and disability, what it means and how that plays out in the service system for people working in services and for people who use services. We'll also speak about called communities and disability, some of the current challenges in service delivery and in the kind of institutional service delivery system. We'll also we'll look at transition from education to employment and share some challenges and insights. Lastly, we'll address some of the gaps by looking at cultural responsiveness in service delivery. On the screen in front of you is a quote from a um, paper published by SSI called Still Outside the Tent, which examined um, the um, experience of people from culturally diverse communities and disability. And the quote reads, people born in a non-English speaking country have similar rates of disability as other Australians, but are half as likely to receive formal assistance. We know that from our analysis, um, in terms of population, people from culturally diverse backgrounds should make up, for example, around 20% of NDIS plans in Australia. At the moment, we are well below 10% in terms of how many people from called backgrounds um, have NDIS plans. So we know that there is a major gap in terms of people's people who are eligibility el eligible to access the National Disability Insurance Scheme and those who are actually benefiting from that scheme. <clears throat> the slide in front of you highlights some of the key challenges that um, call communities face around disability. I'll go into more, more deeply into each of those, but I'll also just go through the four tiles represented on the, screen, on the screen. Firstly, cultural understanding and constructions of disability are a key point of both challenge and opportunity in the intersection of cultural diversity and disability. This refers to the way that disability is understood through a cultural lens. Um, and at this point, it may be useful for me to note that every individual has a culture, organisations have culture, systems and institutions also have culture. And those constructions of what disability means are enacted every day in each of those, each of those individuals and systems. So the way people construct disability, what disability means is highly culturally um, enabled. And that's a key moment for, um, a key area, I suppose, for understanding and discussion. A second key challenge is the role of stigma and disability. As we know, there is 
has been over, over generations, um, many much stigma attached to the experience of disability. In culturally diverse communities, that is also true. Um, and for some communities, there are particular stigma that may be attached to particular types of disability. That relates, of course, to the way that we culturally construct and understand disability. For culturally diverse communities, family and community pressures are also key. And um, in particular, when looking at communities who may be newly arrived or in the process of settlement, there may be particular additional um, pressures on families and communities who haven't um, had access to a, a, a wide range of services and who may also be trying to rebuild family and, and community environments in Australia. The last challenge on your screen that I wanted to mention was key, and that is, of course, the access to the service system. And that's about how well the system manages access and more importantly, inclusion. Um, for many culturally diverse individuals, families and communities, there are absolutely barriers to access. And even for those who get through the doors and access the system, true inclusion and, and, and provision um, of real deep services that are relevant continues to be a challenge. So starting off with cultural barriers to access, on the screen, the slide has five boxes with different cultural barriers to access. I'm gonna take each, I'm gonna speak about each box and I'll read each box out and then um, speak through it. So one of the first key barriers, of course, is language. Um, for many culturally diverse communities, English is um, not the primary language, um, and that might be relevant for people who are newly arrived, but that could still be an issue for people who are second and even third generation migrants to Australia. So English proficiency is a real key um, area of barrier that can, can um, happen for people. Um, it may also be, I suppose, uh, amplified by the use of professional jargon within the system. So even for those who have English or sufficient English to access the system, professional jargon can add another challenge um, to the um, engagement in the system. Um, another area in the, in, the, in the area of language is um, body language and the misinterpretation of body language that can happen in cross-cultural interactions. So for people from culturally diverse backgrounds, there are many layers of how language interacts in the system to become a barrier to access, and then even as access happens, to become a barrier to true inclusion and interaction. The second box on the screen is cultural norms that prohibit seeking extra familial support, especially for women. Um, this is a really uh, significant barrier that it's important to call out. And as I, as I mentioned these, of course, they don't apply to every, every community in every situation. Each, each individual, each family presents um, their own particular uh, issues. Um, but it's worth noting that um, in some, in some, for some cultures, and particularly cultures where there's a strong community-based um, feel or a strong focus on family, it is normative to rely on the family as the main source of support. And in some communities, family issues are generally not ge uh, to be known by outsiders. And for some people, there's a sense that if things were to become known, it could compromise their social standing in the community. Um, this may be particularly impactful for women who are often um, in primary carer roles and are therefore expected to actually continue to provide care uh, without external support. And while it's important not to generalise, and that's a key message from this discussion, we see this impacting significantly across the broad cultural diversity that we work with at SSI. Um, and of course, gender norms across every cultural group um, are key in understanding how families care and seek support. So the next box reads, traditional gender roles that prevent men from engaging with services or discussing family issues. 
So traditional gender roles, as I mentioned, are, are you know, a, a factor in every single t culture in every part of the globe. Um, and th th those gender norms may operate both in um, putting pressure on women as primary carers, but they may also create barriers for men and women in different ways to seeking and, and using supports that are available. Um, it may also um, prevent some people from being fully open about the scale or the dimensions of the challenges or the experience of their disability. And understanding that um, is so key to enabling people not just to be able to get into your service, but to actually fully utilise and be included in the service delivery um, uh, experience. The fourth tile on the page reads fear of authority. So one of the things that uh, SSI is a provider of services to refugees and asylum seekers, but many of you will work with even second or third generation migrant um, communities who have come from an experience of um, oppression. So fear of authorities is a live issue for many people that might have come about as a result of refugee experience. So some of the reasons that people become refugees relate to persecution by governments. It may include things like the medical system being used to um, persecute people or administer punishment. Service delivery may have been used as a way to surveil citizens. And so the very specific experiences people bring can actually impact on their willingness and, um, and ability to engage with services. For people with disabilities, this may be layered underneath all of those other issues that I've talked about that then becomes not only am I scared of, the, of what authorities or government services might deliver, but I also feel that I'm not, um, high, I'm not uh, valued or prioritised. So there can be quite a layering of issues for people who have some concerns or, or distressing experience with authorities. And as service providers, you know, we do bring to that interaction significant institutional power. And being rec recognising that is absolutely key to building that trust and inclusion. The last barrier that, I've, that is on the slide is stigma. And I've already discussed this, so I won't spend a lot of time. But I think that from our experience with culturally diverse clients or participants in our program has been um, that the stigma attached to disability in their community ha um, has often prevented people from getting the support they need when they need it. It may also prevent people from acknowledging the breadth of support they need. Um, it may also have played out in ways that reduce trust and, um, and effectiveness of service delivery. Um, attached to that also is some of the stigma and societal attitudes to people from a range of cultural groups. So stigma can look like being about stigma attached to disability, but it may also play out through uh, a lens of judgment of particular cultural groups. So it's important to think about, again, that intersectionality of the experience of disability and the experience of cultural diversity. And it is important that we call out, there has been, and, and, and some people continue experience um, institutional racism in the way that they have been treated by service systems. Um, and that's an experience that we need to acknowledge and um, we also need to address in the way we work with people. So some of the structural barriers to access similarly address some of these issues, but I think it's worth calling out a number of areas that we've identified have really impacted on people's access to the system and then their inclusion within the system. On the screen, um, there are four boxes which highlight four particular types of um, barriers, and I'll go through each one and read the tile and then explain. 
So firstly, we are, there are practical barriers to accessing services. As we know, um, many people with disabilities experience physical and uh, access barriers to literally accessing a service. For people with cultural, from culturally diverse backgrounds, they may, may be added to via things like um, being newly arrived and not having that um, experience of how to actually physically get to a service, how to use a telephone service, how to use in, the English required to access online services. Um, we also know, particularly for newly arrived refugees, that location may play a part in access. So people might be in um, areas where there is limited public transport. Um, we know, for example, that many refugees in New South Wales are settled in areas where the public transport is not necessarily direct to key health services. Uh, we also know, particularly for some um, communities, that low income is another area. Access to services like childcare are also a challenge for some communities, particularly when working with newly arrived refugees. Um, secondly, there's a, often a lack of understanding of services available, or you could reframe that to say there's a, a poor engagement of the service system in, in communicating to people about the services available. So this might be tied in with language barriers, but it could also reflect um, lack of dissemination of information at a local level in, the, in language or in ways or in venues where people from culturally diverse backgrounds can most access it. So for example, um, in accessing culturally diverse communities, um, it's worthwhile looking at, do we use ethnic radio? Have we got translated information? Have we got people who can answer the phone in language? Um, can people actually understand what it is we do? Knowing that many of the services we provide are, um, high, are highly reliant on an understanding of how the service system works. So that lack of understanding of services can be quite complex um, when we think about, you know, what is a disability service? What is a direct care worker? You know, those kind, that kind of information. The third area of structural barriers to access is, and this may be particularly focused on newer arrivals, is the overseas diagnosis of disability not being accepted by Australian medical standards and service providers. So a challenge, particularly for some of our, our refugee participants, um, is that they may not have actually had their files from overseas um, translated, or they may have to pay significant amounts of money in order to get their files translated. They may also um, just simply not be um, taken into account in Australia for those people who do have information about their um, disability or their medical history, um, there may actually be a reluctance on the part of Australian professionals to use that information or take that information seriously. So that's something that we you know, need to have a think about and is um, something that is particularly impactful for those people who are seeking um, support through the National Disability Insurance Scheme. Um, where, in fact, the, the documentation is key to the whole uh, eligibility and planning process. So there's a lot of work to be done in terms of structural, um, act, act, creating more structurally accessible systems that allows people to actually um, be properly, um, docu have their documents properly acknowledged. Um, and what that might also mean is that uh, people may need to seek uh, appointments with Australian medical practitioners that then, um, you know, that then requires them to make appointments, get, get uh, assessments and other things done, get those and, and pay for those, uh, and then actually, you know, make those available. So, you know, that process can be very challenging. Um, 
And in particular, for, this is particularly for refugees and people seeking asylum, but can impact on um, other uh, migrants and people who've been here for some time. The last tile says no medical history in Australia resulting in difficulties obtaining referrals. So for many people um, who arrive uh, after a refugee experience, they may actually have no medical history at all. And then they may have no history in Australia. So again, that's that requirement then to go through the entire process of building those records so that they can access services. And we know, for example, that access to the disability employment um, scheme requires quite significant amounts of documentation. We know, of course, as mentioned, the um, NDIS has a high you know, um, requirement for, um, uh, access for information documents. Um, but in addition to that, many of many services, you know, quite reasonably do require um, evidence of eligibility or evidence of medical need or other things. So um, that, that can be quite challenging for people. And I should note that for many people with um, disabilities, the health system, and, and in fact, most people who have to no navigate the health system, there can be significant um, challenges in, in navigating the health system. But for today's focus, I guess what we're really uh, focused on is how those issues intersect to amplify some of the challenges of navigating the system. And as I said earlier, when we see in the NDIS, there is only, uh, it's the uptake and usage of NDIS plans by people from culturally diverse backgrounds sits more at around somewhere between seven and 9% nationally, um, where we should be seeing around 20% of all plans. So what that tells us is that the access to say the NDIS is not working. Anecdotally, we also hear that in the disability employment space, and we know that to be true in the uptake and usage of broader social supports um, and health supports. So some of the barriers service providers can perceive or experience, I suppose, which is, you know, flip side of the barriers that participants or, or people with disabilities from culturally diverse backgrounds experience trying to access the system. Similarly, there are barriers, you know, from the system coming out. The slide in front of us sets out five areas of barriers around perception or experience. And sometimes these very much impact on the, um, the feeling of capability in the system to reach out and effectively support people from culturally diverse backgrounds. So I will go through each of the boxes on the screen, and there are five boxes. So firstly, barriers service providers ex perceive or experience. Um, firstly, low confidence to address the needs of culturally diverse individuals and families. So what we do see um, and, and hear from colleagues is that there is a concern that people feel like they don't know how to reach out, that they feel that they may be um, don't understand people's needs or that they feel that perhaps at times um, they're not equipped through to use interpreters or to get appropriate translated material. And that confidence can really impact um, the willingness and I suppose the organisational culture to believe that, you know, we can and, and should outreach or be, be um, proactive in, in connecting with called communities. So that's a real challenge in the service system and one that we really need to address through training, support, um, and building our staff's capability around cultural responsiveness. Secondly, uh, a key barrier for services is that their practice is not culturally responsive. So where we have very rigid ways of engaging with people that don't take into account the experience of the person in, on the other side of the desk, if you like, um, 
that might uh, actually prevent a genuine engagement. So we might reach out, but yet not be able to provide a, a proper or full service to a person uh, because the way we are engaging simply doesn't reach or meet that person's needs. I think no one will be surprised by the third area, which we talk about inadequate resources. We hear this a lot from our colleagues around um, the, the sense or the belief that they don't have the resources to use things like interpreters or to translate material or to train staff. And we know that many of us are working across a highly constrained service system. Um, and in particular, that our staff are often under pressure to deliver to multiple, multiple people during the day. So that is a barrier. I think we would also say that it's um, a perception that we can't deliver to certain groups of people because we don't have the resources. Of course, all of the people who are eligible or have the right to access to our services um, have the right to have uh, the service delivered in an appropriate way. The fourth tile um, that I will discuss, and I've already uh, made reference to this, is of course institutional racism. And while that's something that sometimes can be really hard to say, I think well, we think it's super important to call it out and say that this is um, something that exists. And it does drive the, the way that we think about doing uh, things like translations or interpreting as an extra as opposed to a core part of, you know, um, accessing all of the people who live in our communities. Um, and, you know, as we said earlier, when that interacts with the, the lived experience for people with a disability of often being excluded or treated as less than or not properly, properly um, given appropriate access to services, you can see how those two things can really operate powerfully to exclude actively, proactively exclude people. Um, institutional racism is not a way of accusing people in the room or on this webinar of being racist. What it is about saying is that our systems are sometimes built in a particular cultural context and they continue to operate with moving forward that way. So what we need to do is stop, call it out and, and, and make change. The last tile on, uh, around barriers that service providers experience or perceived is around limited awareness and partnering with culturally diverse focused organisations in their local community. So I know that one of the strengths of the NDCO program has been, uh, for example, that those roles have really connected with cultural organisations to, I hope, uh, to um, engage and build relationships to further connect with people in culturally diverse communities through their, or the organisations that exist that um, people engage with because of cultural practice or shared interest or faith-based organisations. And that's something that is a real opportunity um, for building capability and building connection in the service system. So partnering with faith-based organisations, with cultural groups, with um, advocacy groups from culturally diverse communities to really build um, community capacity and experience in the service system and address some of their perceptions about the service system itself. So we're moving on now to really thinking about how we address the, the gaps in, um, in, address, in um, cultural awareness and competency and service delivery. And we're gonna talk a little bit today about cultural awareness and cultural competency, but we're gonna focus uh, in the second half of the, the discussion on cultural responsive workforce, which actually um, is really where we wanna to move to because awareness is wonderful, even being competent is another, but being culturally responsive is actually the space in which we start to 
interact directly with people and provide services in a way that understand culture and context. On the slide in front of us at the moment, we talk about sort of four key areas and I'll, these will be covered in more depth in the, in the following slide. So I'm just gonna read these and say, these are sort of some high level um, areas that we wanted to, to raise. So intentional inclusion is the first uh, tile on the screen. And that's really about being intentional and starting with the role of culture or understanding the role of culture in service delivery access. Secondly, a key way to address those gaps is around creating inclusive service delivery environments. So it's about getting intentional first. Secondly, creating environments that are inclusive. And that's both from the way we add to the phone, to the way people come through our front door, to how our websites work. Um, thirdly, individual focused means understanding the person. We talk a lot about person-centred practice um, in all aspects of our work in the disability space and in our cross-cultural space. To really deliver person-centred practice, we really need to understand the cultural context that the person brings into the room. And lastly, workforce diversity is key. For us at Settlement Services International, having a, a highly bilingual bicultural workforce helps us really engage broadly across cultures. It also helps us to be instinctive, instinctively inclusive, as well as intentionally inclusive, um, and developing that, that capability of working uh, fluently in bicult bilingual bicultural environments is key. So moving on now into how to build culturally responsive services. Again, as I said, you know, we talk about cultural awareness and that is a great thing. We talk about cultural competence and that's, you know, even better. But building that culturally responsive approach is, is absolutely key. On the, on the slide in front of um, you, there's six tiles which, you know, out, outline um, what a culturally responsive service might look like. And there's also a photo, which is a group shot of, uh, of people from culturally diverse backgrounds. So this, the six tiles on the screen, I'm, I'm really just going to quickly go through them and then I'll focus on the next couple of slides. So we've got building organisational capacity to work cross-culturally. That's about building um, our ability to do that work as individual workers, as teams, as leaders, um, and that means having that, that understanding from the board to the CEO, management, project, field and administrative staff. Secondly, developing the culturally res cultural responsiveness of the workforce. This needs to include face-to-face -face training that allows for deep self-reflection, discussion and personal growth. Um, despite our own highly culturally diverse workforce at SSI, we understand that everyone needs support to develop in this area. And every, regardless of your cultural background, that self-reflection is key. We also understand that diversity has many dimensions um, and they, that those need to be explored as well. The third tile says recruit a diverse workforce. And I think I've covered that, but you know, the opportunities for um, you know, really amplifying the expertise of people with bilingual, bicultural backgrounds. The fourth tile says provide and use language services. That means use interpreters when they're required, um, accessing uh, translation, uh, making sure that we're really thoughtful about how we use those services and that we use them when we need them. But we might also call on um, the particular skills of others in the organisation. The fifth tile says engage with called communities and multicultural service providers and just couldn't call this out enough, you know, as, a, as an organisation with 11 Migrant Resource Centre members, um, the, in, the, the embeddedness of organisations that are linked with culturally diverse communities 
really provides an opportunity to connect with those communities um, and partner with those service providers in ways that will help us really improve the system's reach to culturally diverse people. So, you know, identifying who those communities are in the local area and building those relationship, relationships. The last tile in this show says, make resource provisions to support the strategies. I think I alluded to this earlier, in a constrained resource environment, it can be um, a challenge to allocate resources. But when we see the world through an understanding that everybody has the, with, who's eligible may have the right to access our services, it is absolutely incumbent on us all to allocate resources to support this work. So the last few minutes of the webinar are going to focus on culturally responsive practice. The slide in front of us just includes a, a definition of that. So culturally responsive practice is delivering a service and interacting with people in a way that is respectful of and relevant to the beliefs, practices, culture and linguistic needs of diverse populations and communities. Culturally re responsive practice is more than just, and I say that with um, apostrophes, just being respectful um, or tolerant of others' difference, but it is actually about seeking ways to find, uh, to work with people that are relevant to their culture and experience. And that, include, and that includes many things such as how they understand their context and, what, and the solutions they want. Um, it's much more than awareness. It's engaging with people's beliefs and working with the person as they are. And I should say that as I describe and, and talk through culturally responsive practice, many of you will see yourselves here because it's so much a part of how we uh, deliver high quality person-centered practice. There's no silver bullet, if you'll excuse the, um, the overused phrase, but it's, uh, it, it is about that deep engagement with people um, and interacting. So on the next slide, um, I'm gonna spit, you know, step through culture, our culturally responsive practice framework. Um, we do this uh, as a full day workshop this, very, this slide is usually a full day workshop, but we wanted to kind of step out how it is that we understand uh, culturally responsive practice and, and how it can work. And as I said, many of you will see yourselves in here um, and that's the great you know, strength of, of the system is that we have many of these skills and capabilities. Now it's about how do we amplify and, and really scale that up. So on the screen in front of us, we have a slide that has three bubbles <laughs> and, I'm gonna, and um, I'm gonna talk through those. Basically, the bubbles represent an interaction between two people. So at the top of the slide, there's a bubble that says, what do I bring? And then plus, a plus sign, and at the bottom, there's a bubble that says, what do they bring? On the left hand of those bubbles are some factors that we need to talk through and I'll, I'll call those out specifically. There is also then an, a third bubble with an arrow which talks about, you know, what this leads to. So I know that's possibly not the most eloquent um, description of the slide, but I'm trying to kind of describe the visuals that, that not everyone in the room is going to be able to, to see. So, um, Culturally responsive practice recognises that there, every interaction has two sides, whether it's one to many or one to one, one to three, um, there's always two sides in that, in that interaction. On one, at, at the top of the slide is the bubble that says, what do I bring? And that's the worker, so that's really us. And the, the, the key thing about um, culturally responsive practice is, is essentially it's an interactive process. So in, in order for it to be a truly interactive process, we've got to start with the person who's delivering a service. And key to that is that deep sense of understanding where you actually ask, 
Who am I? What is my culture? And it's worth, you know, me saying at this point that everybody has culture. No matter who you are in, in whatever room, every individual has a cultural context that they bring. So when I talk about culture, I'm not talking about other people have culture and I'm the norm. I'm talking about culture is something we all bring. Some of us are from a, a majority culture, which gives us some, uh, I suppose, uh, uh, sort of unseen assumptions that we believe and because they are often um, strongly uh, reinforced by our environment, we might not necessarily notice that we have that cultural assumption. Okay, on the left side, on the left side of the slide, you can see that some of the "what do I bring?" questions that we ask in in that self reflection piece for workers is, "What's your cultural identity? What does that mean in the context of the work you're doing? What are your cultural constructions of disability?" What are your values and norms? What are some of the assumptions that you make? So a really good example here is often people assume that politeness is demonstrated by saying please and thank you or being on time. That these are um, strongly you know, developed cultural assumptions. So understanding what your expectation is, what you're bringing into the room is, is very important. The other kind of pieces that we need to understand there are what our biases are. So what we bring into the room in terms of our preference or even those, um, you know, those unconscious biases about who we, who we feel comfortable with, who we feel um, frightened of, what we might um, assume about people from the way they look, the way they speak, the way they present. The other piece in terms of worker um, self-reflection is the issue of power and what is the power that is in the room? What is your institutional power or your power as a, as a provider of service, as a person undertaking an assessment that may have impact on people? Um, you need to, you know, thinking about the power in the room and also what is your explanatory model of, of disability? of understanding how people behave. Once we understand ourselves, then we're truly interacting and responding to the person in front of us. And I'll just quickly talk about what the person in front of us may bring to their discussion. So they will bring, like you, their culture, their values, norms, assumptions, their biases. And however, their culture might sit in that broader context. For people from culturally diverse backgrounds, and in particular refugees and migrants, but this might still be impacting on people who are second or even third generation Australian, um, we might see, for example, what's the impact of a forced migration experience? So that's we, as a refugee, um, you've been forced, you've had to flee from your country, or as an asylum seeker, you've felt uh, unable to return to your country, for example. What is your experience, uh, what is a person's experience of settlement or resettlement in Australia? What are the intersectionalities they bring to that? For example, what are the intersectionalities of gender and disability and culture that that person is exper experiencing? And being highly curious about that, unpacking that is, is, is critical. So it, it, when I say, what do they bring? That's what the bubble on there says. Um, that's about understanding culture in context and understanding the diversity within cultures. So that even when we have information about the lived experience of a particular group, i.e. we might know a little bit about an Iraqi person because we know a bit about some of the culture that, or we know some facts about their, their home country, that doesn't mean that we understand all people from that, from that cultural background. So we need to understand how they understand their culture and then overlay it with context. When we understand both sides of that interaction, we, this leads to the skills that we, that leads us to make choices about the skills we use around communication and collaboration. What do we need um, to be able to engage, plan and deliver services? So you can see this model is really a step beyond cultural awareness or cultural competency. It's about an active interaction 
I'm moving. I'm moving now on to just quickly to highlight a couple of uh, SSI services in this area in, that are available, mo many of which are available nationally and some of which are in New South Wales that may be of use. I wanted to just call out our Future Ability Project, which is very much about information and linkages for people with disability and for the service system. Um, so we've got a particularly, I wanted to highlight the National Multilingual Disability Hub, which is a um, phones and online um, website, a website that includes a multilingual hotline that provides relevant and easily accessible information on disability and the NDIS to cold lab communities in 14 languages. And that's available to people all over Australia. In New South Wales, we also deliver in-language workshops um, on the NDIS and on disability. The next slide is about the Our Voice project. I just wanted to call this out. Our Vo the Our Voice project is an ILC grant funded project that actually provides opportunities for mainstream disability service providers to build their capacity in responding to the access needs of people from culturally diverse backgrounds through learning from people with lived experience. We have a group of trained lived experience educators who are people with a disability from culturally diverse backgrounds who can share their experience to disability organisations and others to really help um, understand what, what, what it's like to, to use those services and how their story can share some, you know, those ideas around cultural responsiveness. And lastly, uh, SSI's diversity training, um, or, uh, training unit offers uh, training in culturally responsive um, practice uh, Australia-wide. And I will just note for people in Victoria, New South Wales and Queensland, um, we were recently awarded a Jobs and Market Fund grant, which will allow us to deliver cultural responsiveness training to disability organisations um, for free or low cost. So that service will be available into the future. I realise that I've gone over time, so I will stop now and uh, we'll address some of the questions. Thank you, Karen. That was a wonderful and very informative presentation. We do have quite a lot of questions, um, so we'll see how we go getting through all of those. I would just like to remind people that if we don't get to your question or you feel like it hasn't adequately been covered, um, there is an opportunity after the webinar to complete a short survey and you do have free text box options there to ask additional questions. So we'll just get started with the, the first of the questions that have come through on the webinar today. Um, we have a question about how can universities help to support students from culturally diverse backgrounds who have identified as having a disability to transition into graduate employment? Um, and, and second part of that question, what assumptions do we make about employment that are not culturally responsive? For example, full-time employment as a measure of graduate success, even though that not, may not match an individual's aspiration. Um, what a great question. I think um, some of that you would take as a comment, really. <laughs> I think uh, just to respond, I think that makes a really good point around what are, what are the assumptions we make about what are the measures of success. And uh, really, I think that's a question for universities to consider in terms of um, what do they think makes success for graduates? Is that culturally responsive or, and, and is that really um, a, what constitutes a success for that individual individual. But the first part of that question was about um, what makes what how can universities be more responsive to the needs of called students with a disability? I think the many of the components of the pro presentation today address that. I think you know we're we're making that leap into firstly believing that people um, 
with disabilities should be able to access every part of the university life and education. And I think that, in all, that you know, that's, you know, the first frontier that many universities are still addressing. And I guess when that's overlaid with the intersectionality of cultural diversity, the impact may be that where there are supports and services available for people with disabilities in universities, that they may actually not be highly socialised in some communities. So people may just not be aware of them, the easy way of saying that. Um, and so it's about how do universities actually proactively communicate into culturally diverse communities about the availability of support for students with a disability and how to access that. I'm not an expert in the, dis in the university space, but I, I think that it would be fair to say that for many students, the bureaucratic process of accessing support can be challenging. So an add on that if there are language or, or cultural barriers or a sense of not belonging that might act as a barrier for people, um, that I think that then it's that incumbent on us to reach out. And I'd really recommend, you know, connecting with cultural community organisations to seek advice on how might you share this information more broadly um, on campus, you know, engaging with cultural groups on campus to do that. But also, and the challenge of course, is that making sure that this is part of the conversation when we talk about how we fund student services. Fantastic, thanks Karen. I'm going to move us to the next question. Um, and before I do, just acknowledging we will not have time to get through every question. Are you happy, Karen, for us to send you a list of the questions and, and get some written responses that we can send back out? With oh, absolutely. Community. We're very happy, you know, and happy for people to reach out and, and have a conversation. Wonderful. Thank you. I'm just going to share an observation from one of our attendees today. Um, and this is around the parallels between called communities and the deaf community. The observation is that in many ways, the deaf community is also a called community, despite the majority of people being born here into English speaking families. This presentation is resonating very strongly with this attendee based on lived and professional experience and knowledge of the deaf community. So that's just an observation, but that leads into a question from another attendee, which is, is quite specific. How do we deal with requests for another nationality sign language to be used to help a potential student in Australia when the only endorsed sign language to use is Auslan? This is of particular importance to English as second language um, deaf clients who are doing English studies. That's a very specific question. I feel like it's a little bit outside my expertise, but it's certainly been raised with us in other environments. Um, certainly those, those questions have been raised and I don't have the answer to that, but I think that there is a conversation perhaps that needs to be had with the... Um, um, the, I'm trying to, the national, in, I think is it NADA, the national interpreting, the, the kind of head or the, you know, peak organisation for interpreters. I think that's a bit of a conversation to have with them. I also think that this is an advocacy question more than anything in terms of who is it that we need, that can support a, a, a more effective conversation about um, recognised language. Um, and, and these issues have actually been um, a challenge for many language groups in the past. And I, I don't want to diminish the experience of people from um, who use other, other sign languages other than Auslan. Um, but I, I will make a parallel that over the years, it's taken so, us some time to fully recognise all languages where there are particular dialects. So over, to, and, and I'm not suggesting that these are dialects, but I'm, you know, that's the example I can draw on. Um, it is actually about going through that process to recognition. Um, so I'm not 100% sure of the exact pathway to that, but certainly happy to um, think about who might be a good, who might be the conversation starter because I suspect that's an advocacy question rather, yeah. rather than one I can answer. Thank you, Karen. Final question, because we are just over time. Um, with the 14 languages included on the 
Disability Hub, does that include ab Aboriginal languages? Uh, no, it doesn't. And um, I should have said this at the very beginning. Um, we work with primarily people from culturally diverse communities who are not Abri and Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. I recognise the extensive cultural diversity there. We don't um, actually pretend or or promote the us as people as an organisation who has that deep experience. And um, in fact, I think that there are a number of organisations, particularly through the First Peoples Disability Network, um, that are better placed and have more expertise in providing culturally appropriate and, and responsive um, uh, information and support for Aboriginal people seeking to access the NDIS. But a terrific question and thank you for picking that up. Thanks so much, Karen. I'm going to wrap this up there and just remind people to complete the short survey at the end of the webinar, which will pop up on your screen. Um, we will try and get some answers for you for the remainder of the questions. I've got about a whole page and a half of them here for you, Karen, just a heads up. Um, and for all of our attendees, we will try and send you the responses to those questions along with the recording of the webinar when that's available. Thank you so much for coming today. And again, thanks to our presenters, Karen and Kylie, and to our Auslan interpreter, Kate, and our captioners, Paul and Sandy. And of course, to all of you as our attendees for coming along and taking an interest in this important topic. Thank you.